Hi, it's Katrina, the alchemical door of Rivodutri. In the small Italian village of Rivodutri, most of everything was destroyed in a devastating earthquake that took place in 1948. But there was one curious architectural element that remained standing when everything else was shattered. It's called the alchemical door, and it's nothing short of bizarre. The portal, because that's really what it looks like these days, was originally located in the Camicioti Palazzo, but now stands guard in front of a small memorial park. It was created in the 17th century, with one side of the door decorated in strange carvings and symbols that are supposed to represent the idea of the Great Transmutation. If you're not sure what transmutation is, let me quickly explain. Ancient alchemists believed one material could be transmuted or changed into a different material, usually worthless metal, into precious gold. Alchemists were convinced that if they had the right formula, they could transform any ordinary metal into gold and therefore get stinking rich. But instead of displaying the formula for how to turn metal into gold, experts believe this doorway was decorated with symbols meant to represent the transmutation of the soul into a state of awareness. It's all quite confusing, especially when you look at the actual symbols that are on the door. There are pagan symbols, Christian symbols, Kabbalistic and alchemical symbols, all of them arranged in such a way that scholars have never been able to decode it. Nobody knows if the door is supposed to be read from the bottom or the top. All we really know is that the 17th century was a time when the nobility of Europe were deeply involved with alchemical practices. It was a weird merger between science and magic, secrets of biology, and esoteric knowledge. The alchemical doorway of Rivodutri is one of the very last pieces of this mysterious time in history still standing. The Fairy Door Ben Bulbin is a fascinating place in Ireland. It's a rock formation shaped like a jaw in County Sligo. It's a massive piece of rock that was formed during the Ice Age by moving glaciers and almost looks like a wave of limestone and mudstone. And because of its unique appearance, it has been the site of a lot of Irish myths. One of the legends has something to do with a fairy door. Most people probably don't believe in fairies these days, but until recently the Irish certainly did. Not only did they believe that fairies were real, but they also believed that there was one place to see them in the human realm, at Ben Bulbin. It was here where the Irish said there was a literal fairy door, a huge black scorch mark on the northern face of the rock formation that looks exactly like a door. It was said the fairy door would open on occasion, and that fairies would slip out into the human world to frolic before going back through the door and closing it behind them. It was very similar to the beliefs the Irish had about the Samhain festival, or maybe the original Halloween. There were certain times and certain places in Ireland where the doorways between the worlds would open, and humans could interact with spirits. At Ben Bulbin, they believed there was a door that allowed them to interact with fairies. Any Irish people out there, please let us know if this is true in the comments below. The Roman Portal to Hell there is a doorway in modern Turkey that if you were to walk through it, you would end up dead. Thousands of years ago in the world of ancient Greece, it was considered a literal gateway to the depths of hell. Anyone who got too close to the doorway would die, and anyone who wandered through it was never seen again. It was so convincingly evil and obviously dangerous that nobody in the ancient world had any doubt it led directly down to Hades. In fact, it became a great place of sacrifice and ritual. Priests learned exactly how close they could stand to the doors without dying, and they would sacrifice animals to the lord of the underworld Hades in the days of the Greeks, and then Pluto in the days of the Romans. This is not a legend and it is not made up. It's 100% true. The fact is that the Roman doorway to hell is actually a man-made gateway to an underground cavern with significant levels of carbon dioxide. The gas slips out from the cavern in high concentrations at night and in the early morning, then dissipates during the day. You can still see the poisonous gas within the cavern coming out in hot mist. Thanks to science, we know it's just geothermal activity from the Earth. But to the ancients, it was the toxic breath of the hounds of hell. The Doorway in King Tut's Tomb There is a strange doorway in King Tut's tomb that experts believe may lead to a totally unexplored burial chamber. In fact, Egyptian and foreign archaeologists alike believe the chamber beyond the doorway could lead to the mummy of Queen Nefertiti. The western and northern walls of the tomb of Tutankhamun may hide burial chambers, according to a bunch of different sources, including the Egyptian state press and archaeologist Nicholas Reeves. 
Reeves believes the tomb of Tutankhamun, the famous boy pharaoh from the 18th dynasty, had two doors plastered and then painted over. His theory is that the doorways and the entire tomb was built for Nefertiti and not for Tutankhamun. The beautiful Nefertiti was the wife of one of the most infamous pharaohs, Akhenaten, and it's believed that he fathered Tutankhamun with a different woman. And while the family history of the pharaohs is extremely confusing, so too is the tomb itself. The issue is that archaeologists can simply bust through the walls of one of the most important tombs in the world on a hunch. It's just not feasible. It may have been pillaged after it was originally found in 1922 by Howard Carter, but it can't be destroyed today. At least, not until we have overwhelming evidence that the lines in the stone are in fact the lines of doors, and that beyond them are even greater lost treasures. What do you think could be hiding on the other side of the walls of King Tut's tomb? Let me know your theories in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe before you go. The Skin Door The oldest door in Britain is about 950 years old and was once believed to be covered in human flesh. According to archaeologists, the oak door in Westminster Abbey was put in its current position sometime in the 1050s during the reign of Edward the Confessor, the very man who founded the abbey. This makes it the only surviving Anglo-Saxon door anywhere in Britain. It's an astounding piece of history, but it's also pretty disturbing. Initial tests on fragments of the door show that it was made of skin. However, a spokeswoman for the abbey said it was cowhide, not human hide. The thing is that there's been a legend attached to this door for centuries that says it was originally bound in the skin of a punished man. The person from the Middle Ages had been caught committing sacrilege. They were flayed, their skin was peeled off of them, and then it was nailed to the door to deter others from committing sacrilege. As interesting of a legend as that is, the tests show the door was actually bound in ordinary cow leather. Sorry to disappoint. The door was made from a single tree, and it's over six and a half feet wide. It opens directly into the chapter house where monks used to meet for their daily prayers in the 13th century. Experts have known this door was old for a long time just by looking at it, but it's only recently that they figured out just how old it was. Aramu Muru Aramu Muru is either an abandoned construction project or a magical doorway to another dimension. I don't think it's both. This place is located on Lake Titicaca, very near to the border with Bolivia. It was originally found in the 1990s when a mountaineering guide came across it in the Peruvian countryside. He found it curious because it appeared to be the wall of some great structure, a completely flat surface with a small door-like alcove in the center. The flat stone is around 23 feet and the doorway is just over six and a half feet. Nobody can say for certain what the purpose of the doorway ever was. Archaeologists say it could have been an architectural flourish, part of an incomplete Inca construction project, but at the same time, locals believe the doorway once held great power. They actually call it Puerta de Ayumarca, which translates to the Gate of the Gods. There are stories about people vanishing through the doorway, strange lights coming from it in the night, and even tall, inhuman creatures slipping through the frame as if from another dimension. So either somebody built this very specifically to be a portal several thousand years ago, or it's the entrance to a building that never got finished. The Lion Gate The Lion Gate is an ancient doorway in Greece to what was once the fortified citadel of Mycenae. The doorway is about 10 feet wide and 10 feet high, guarded by two huge lion sculptures above its top beam. Just beyond the door is a small alcove where archaeologists believe the guards once kept a small pack of dogs to alert them of any intruders. Thousands of years ago, there was a huge wooden door in the entrance, locked from the inside with a wooden bar. The gateway was erected sometime in the 13th century BC and is the only surviving monumental piece of architecture from the prehistoric Aegean. It would have been the very first thing someone saw when they approached the walls of the city. This was the home of the Mycenaean people, a Bronze Age city-state that lasted until about 3,000 years ago. The city sheltered beyond the Lion Gate was home to one of the most important Greek civilizations of the time. It was a major military stronghold that had control over most of southern Greece. The city itself had a population of around 30,000 people, but by the year 1200 BC, earthquakes and invasions had brought the city-state down on its head. All these years later, the only thing left of them are a few broken ruins and the Lion Gate, the only major piece of their civilization still standing. The Tomb in the Mountain Just a short drive from the small city of Korum in Turkey, there is a great mountain valley, and on the face of one of these mountains is a mysterious rock doorway that leads to no 
nowhere. Almost nothing is known about this strange site, other than that it was most likely made in the 2nd century BC. Locals call it the Tomb of Kapilikaya, yet nobody was ever found buried here. There is a short staircase leading directly up the mountainside to the enormous hanging door of the tomb, but the door doesn't swing open. It doesn't actually move at all. There are gaps on the sides that you can walk around to enter the tomb, which is just a single spacious chamber. The actual grave is nothing but a small black niche in the back of the chamber with an inscription above the entrance, but nobody knows what the inscription means or who was ever buried here. There are no guards standing out front to keep visitors from creeping inside and damaging the place, so it's covered in graffiti. There is no actual road to get you here either. It's one of the most bizarre and forgotten archaeological sites in Turkey, just a huge door once meant to guard someone's tomb over 2,000 years ago. Egyptian Doors to the Afterlife In tombs throughout ancient Egypt, there are strange doors carved into the walls behind where people were laid to mummify in their coffins. These false doors are really just artistic representations of doors, either carved or painted. They don't actually open, but they were extremely important to the ancient Egyptians. The false doors that you see in all the most important tombs throughout the kingdom were thought of as doors to the afterlife. Each door was carved from a single piece of stone or a large plank of wood. At the center of the door was a flat niche, with fake door jams arranged around it to give it the illusion of depth. It was the closest the Egyptians could get to creating a functioning portal to the beyond. To the Egyptians, carving a false door in a tomb created a threshold between the world of the living and the world of the dead. It allowed the spirit of the deceased to enter and exit at their leisure, passing from the physical world into the afterlife at whim. It was an extremely important architectural design inside a tomb, because without it, the spirit had no logical way of reaching the afterlife. False doors were also placed inside offering chapels. In offering chapels, family members could come and pay their respects to their dead loved ones. They would place offerings on a stone slab in front of the fake door for the dead soul to come pick it up later. Portals to the Dead Viking homes were very interesting and are something you don't really see shown much in the wildly popular Viking TV shows these days. We see Viking warriors and obscure political drama, but not much of the ordinary Viking home life. The truth is that the Viking house was an important place for families and for the dead. There's enough archaeological evidence for the experts to say beyond any doubt that the dead had a major presence in houses all throughout the Viking Age. Human bones were frequently embedded in the foundations of houses, with young infants being buried directly underneath the hearths. But the most meaningful place to bury a person was underneath the threshold of a house, right beneath the doorway. Different parts of the home served as different points of contact between those living in it and those buried underneath it. Some women were said to be able to actually see into either the future or into another realm if they were lifted above the front door. The Vikings believed there was power in putting bones in the threshold, and that those with the gift could use this power to create a sort of portal to the other world. Troy In the 1870s, an amateur archaeologist by the name of Heinrich Schliemann discovered the lost city of Troy. However, he also inadvertently almost destroyed it. Heinrich was a German businessman with a taste for archaeology. In 1873, he discovered a lost cache of artifacts in the Turkish town of Hisarlik. He immediately identified these treasures as having belonged to King Priam, the mythical king of Troy. This led to the theory that Hisarlik was in fact the location of Troy, the city from Homer's great story, the Iliad. But here's the incredible thing about what happened. Yes, Heinrich got lucky when he identified Hisarlik as the real city of Troy, but the treasure he discovered actually had nothing to do with it. Archaeologists dated the treasure to 1,250 years before the Trojan War even started. It had come from a totally different civilization, one that had lived a millennium before the Trojans ever came around. And now here comes the destruction. Archaeologists assumed Trojan treasure would be at the lowest level of the archaeological site, and so, even though they knew there was lots of archaeological evidence from other civilizations, they dug it all up trying to find riches. The discovery of Troy was a huge fiasco and basically a 19th century treasure hunt. By the time Heinrich was done pillaging the gold and other goods from Troy, he had destroyed almost every trace of the ancient city he'd originally wanted to find. Ancient Tomb of Secrets 
A mysterious ancient tomb belonging to a dignitary at the highest level of government has just been discovered in Egypt. This guy was kind of like the director of the FBI, or maybe the CIA, whichever one has access to all the juiciest and most secret documents. He had full entry to all the forbidden mysteries of the pharaohs, and was charged with protecting that information with his life. This was about 4,700 years ago. According to the hieroglyphs found in the man's tomb, his name was Metechu. The hieroglyphs also said that he was a top official with access to royal sealed documents. And this explains why the tomb was discovered right next to the Steppe Pyramid of Dozer. The Steppe Pyramid was the very first one to be built by the ancient Egyptians, constructed as a monument to the dead King Djoser. Centuries after he was dead, the tradition of burying high-level officials near the pyramid continued. Meteju lived during the first three pharaohs of the 6th dynasty. That includes Teti, Userkare, and Pepi I. We don't know how many of these pharaohs he served, but it was at least two or three of them between 2323 and 2255 BC. You could think of him like Jafar in the Aladdin movie as the advisor to all the rulers of Egypt. His other names included Inspector of the Royal Estate, and he was also a priest of the mortuary cult of Pharaoh Teti. He did it all. Sadly, we don't actually know what kind of secrets he was keeping. None of those documents have been found, and researchers are still combing through the tomb, looking for more evidence. Lovelock Cave In the legends of the Native American tribes of Nevada, the Peyote, they speak of giants. The Peyote once told stories to the early white settlers about a mysterious race of barbarians, which they called the Cite Ka. They described these giants as being extremely unfriendly, unnecessarily aggressive, and horrifyingly cannibalistic. According to the legend, there was a great battle between the regular humans and the giants, and it took place at Lovelock Cave. Here's where things get really interesting. In the early 20th century, archaeologists stumbled upon Lovelock Cave, the site of the Great Giant Extinction. Much to their surprise, they found thousands of artifacts within the cave. It was enough for the superstitious and easily excitable 20th century folks to believe the story was real. The artifacts included weapons, bones, baskets, and tools. It was enough evidence to show that people did indeed live in the cave for a very long time, starting somewhere around 2000 BC. An occupation here lasted for about 3,000 years. There was an actual culture that lived inside of this cave, but not at all related to the Peyutes. And so the consensus is that the legend was most likely very real, although the people in the cave weren't actually giants. They were probably just a different tribe, maybe a tribe of cannibals, that the Peyute hunted to extinction. The Colossi of Memnon The Colossi of Memnon were built to represent the great pharaoh Amenhotep III, who ruled Egypt for a brief time in the 18th dynasty. The enormous statues were completed in 1350 BC. They are truly massive titans, rising 60 feet above the ground, with each statue weighing 720 tons. They were carved from single pieces of sandstone, making them some of the biggest and most impressive sculptures ever. But it's not only the size of the colossi that makes them so fantastic, it's the legend behind them. These statues were originally meant to be guardians for Amenhotep III's mortuary complex, which once stood directly behind them, but has since been destroyed by floods and earthquakes. Almost nothing remains today, nothing except the colossi. Almost 3,500 years later, they are still sitting patiently on their thrones outside the city of Luxor, watching over the Nile River. When the Greeks came to Egypt and saw the colossi, they named them after their own hero, Memnon. Memnon was an Ethiopian king who fought in the Trojan War and died at the hands of the champion Achilles. When Greek tourists saw the huge statues, they immediately associated them with the Ethiopian king instead of the Egyptian pharaoh they were actually modeled after. And so here comes the strangest part about the Colossi. Sometime around the year 20 AD, a Greek historian by the name of Strabo wrote that the statues used to sing at dawn. Early in the morning, one could hear a kind of gentle humming noise coming from the statues, as if a woman was quietly singing. This phenomenon was heard by Roman emperors and regular people for hundreds of years. Yet for some unknown reason, it seems to have stopped in modern times. It's shout out time! Big thank you to Sean Barnes and Be Quiet for supporting this channel! Remember to subscribe if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family!
the New York City of Canada. The Mantle site was founded roughly between the years 1500 and 1530. It was, for its time, the biggest and most cosmopolitan settlement in North Canada. It sat on the shores of Lake Ontario, and it was kind of like the original New York City. The Huron Native Americans created the settlement, which was about the size of Manhattan. By the time the Europeans arrived, there were about 1,800 people living at the site. That's not much more than a few city blocks these days, but it was unheard of in Canada 500 years ago. The Native Americans usually lived in very small tribes of nomads and typically traveled place to place instead of settling in one large community. Researcher Jennifer Birch described Mantle as more of a medieval town than an old Native American community, because even though the cultures were wildly different, the formation of society was almost exactly the same. Sadly, there isn't a lot left of Mantle these days. Even though it's a huge site, it remained hidden underneath vegetation for hundreds of years, while the archaeological evidence decayed and vanished. Researchers have uncovered the remains of 98 longhouses, but only the imprint of them left on the ground. Nalanda 1,000 years ago, there was a university called Nalanda. According to the legends, this great school of learning located in India attracted students from all over the world. Young people from Persia, Greece, Tibet, China all came to this university to study in its famous library. Subjects such as theology, logic, metaphysics, and philosophy were all taught here. The school was the pride of ancient India, and it could almost be compared to the Library of Alexandria in Egypt. But just like the Great Library, this mysterious school came to an abrupt and violent end. In the year 1193, an army of Turks showed up. They ransacked the school, burned the Buddhist monks alive, beheaded the students, and left the people and their beloved university in shambles. The library was burned to the ground, and all traces of the school vanished until the 19th century. Legend goes the library contained so many books and manuscripts that the fire raged on for three months. And while that may not actually be true, it goes to show just how prestigious of an institution Nalanda really was. These days, Nalanda is nothing of its former self. All that's left are high stone walls that weren't torn down, staircases that wouldn't burn, and floors of brick that were lost under wild growth. The most famous part of Nalanda today is its giant stupa. Surrounding the main stupa are several smaller ones, containing the remains of the monks and scholars who once resided at the university. The current archaeological park is about 14 hectares, although researchers say that only represents 10% of the original area of the school. It was truly a massive and unrivaled place in the ancient world. The Themistoclean Wall In the year 479 BC, the Persians attacked Athens. It was a brutal fight, but the Greeks managed to push the Persians out of their territory. Following the fighting, Themistocles urged the Athenians to fortify their city. His suggestion was to build great walls to keep the Persians out. However, the Spartans didn't think it was a good idea. They believed that if the Persians ever came back, they would simply occupy the city itself and use its walls against the Greeks. Despite the warning of the Spartans, the Athenians went ahead and built the wall anyway. Within just a few years, Athens was surrounded by one of the greatest walls the ancient world had ever seen. It was about 8 feet thick, 24 feet tall, and 8 meters long. They even dug themselves a moat around the wall to help defend themselves from any potential invasion. Alas, the Great Wall turned out to be completely useless. In the year 86 BC, the Romans snuck into the city one night under the cover of darkness and smashed the wall to pieces. Emperor Hadrian rebuilt the wall, but later raids on Athens saw it destroyed yet again. And today, there is very little trace of the walls which once protected the city. Only a few chunks of it have been found, with the best preserved section near the Holy Gate, where the Romans once held a procession to the Eleusinian Mysteries. Romano-British Trading Center Archaeologists in England recently stumbled upon a mysterious trade center from the days when Rome occupied the British Isles. Researchers with Oxford Archaeology were performing excavations at Bishop Stortford, a historic town located in the heart of Hertfordshire, or Hertfordshire. The commercial center was built alongside what was once an ancient Roman highway. In fact, it was almost like a rest stop. It was here they discovered evidence of various businesses that had been set up in the town specifically to serve the needs of travelers. Sure, they found a Roman cemetery, plenty of Roman coins and smashed pieces of pottery, but the really interesting discoveries were in the form of facilities. 
Evidence of an ancient inn where merchants and adventurers would have stayed the night. They found a blacksmith facility right next to the inn where those same travelers could have their wagons mended and their armaments improved. There was even a religious temple for villagers to pray or meditate depending on which gods they worshipped. Archaeologists say the town was likely founded around the year 43 AD and continued to function as a waypoint for weary wanderers up until around 410 AD. Then, for an unknown reason, the site was abandoned. Settlements under the Amazon Just recently, researchers used specialized lasers to penetrate the dense jungle canopy of the Amazon. They did this to map out the land beneath. And thanks to these special lasers, scientists discovered 11 previously unknown settlements deep in the Amazon jungle. These settlements were complete with pyramids, waterways, highways, and so much more. This new discovery has revealed an entirely unknown world in South America, one occupied by an unknown but seemingly advanced race of humans. The researchers examined six specific areas within a region of 1,737 square miles. They did this in the Bolivian part of the Amazon using laser equipment fixed to a helicopter. They found two main settlements, which were about the size of large prehistoric cities. And then they identified 24 smaller sites, although 15 were already known. These weren't just a bunch of jungle huts. These were big communities with water managing infrastructure, complex canals and reservoirs, pyramids of over 70 feet tall, and everything else you would expect from an ancient society anywhere in the Mediterranean. It's believed this part of the Bolivian Amazon was home to the Casarabe culture, although almost nothing is known about these people. They occupied the region from 500 to 1400 AD, yet all of their settlements and villages have already been eaten up by the jungle. This discovery is even bigger than it might sound because until recently, no respectable archaeologist believed that a complex culture lived in the Amazon. It was thought the jungle was too dense and the people were too primitive. But as we can see, that wasn't the case at all. The biggest mystery here is trying to figure out where these people came from and why they faded into oblivion while their cities were swallowed by nature. Wyoming Quarry A red ochre quarry has been discovered in Wyoming and it's 13,000 years old. It was found in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, buried underneath a large forested hill. According to archaeologists, it's indisputable proof that professional quarrying was happening at least 12,840 years ago, to be exact. In Wyoming, the Paleo Indians dug the very first mine shaft in North America to bring out raw red ochre for use in all kinds of things. It's a pretty incredible timeline when you consider that humans weren't even supposed to have arrived in North America until 13,000 years ago. It seems unusual that in such a short amount of time, they made it down to Wyoming and became amateur miners. But there is no arguing with scientific dating. People were definitely here, and they were definitely using the red ochre for everything from pigments for rituals to cave paintings. And to make the discovery even more amazing, it's the only ancient red ochre quarry ever identified north of southern Mexico. Abandoned Aquarium A French urban explorer decided to go into an abandoned Spanish aquarium and film her experience. Inside, she saw the abandoned remains of what had once been a bustling theme park. You know, kind of like SeaWorld, but super creepy. She came across a rotting shark carcass, a dead squid, skeletal starfish, and all kinds of other marine nightmares. The explorer's name is Juliette, originally from the French city of Lyon, but unfortunately we have no clue what the name of the aquarium is. Even though this video has gone super viral with millions and millions of views, nobody seems to know exactly which rundown park she broke into and recorded. She probably did that on purpose to not get in trouble. But what we do know is that this wasn't just some aquatic graveyard. Most of the dead creatures she saw had probably already been dead when the aquarium closed. No one wants to believe that the employees left the animals to fend for themselves until they ran out of water and shriveled up into mummies. No, it's actually very likely these animals were already preserved. Take the creepy shark, for example. It may look like a zombie now, but it was probably originally treated with chemicals and kept in a specialized airtight case. Then the aquarium closed and the glass on its tank was shattered, perhaps by previous explorers. Now the creature is slowly decaying into a terrifying looking shark mummy. The Lost Police Station Urban explorers in Scotland recently gave the world a rare glimpse into an abandoned Glasgow police station. Located on Argyle Street, 
It originally opened back in 1960. The Cranston Hill Police Station has been empty for about the last 10 years. Real estate developers West Point Homes is currently trying to demolish the site and build 84 apartments, but it hasn't happened yet. And so this could be the last look anyone has at the police station before it's completely destroyed. It's a rather creepy place. The urban explorers documented their journey through depressing cells where criminals had once been locked up. Rusting pipes, metal gates, busted light fixtures, and the unmistakable spooky vibe of treading through a potentially haunted cell block. The front desk of the police station has a sign that reads, even the cops can't keep us out. Everything in general looks pretty depressing. Would you be brave enough to explore this place? Nuclear Bunker An urban explorer who goes only by the name of Jim came across an exceptionally well-preserved doomsday bunker. He snuck inside of an abandoned mansion in Adelaide, Australia. The mansion itself was creepy enough, but it also had a mysterious dungeon below. According to what Jim told Newsweek, the building has been abandoned for a very long time. It was originally built in the 1800s and has had lots of owners over the years. Locals believe the place is cursed because they say that everyone who owns it suffers misfortune and dies. The manor really is a mansion with seven bedrooms, five bathrooms, all laid out across one sprawling floor. Jim went inside the place intending to photograph its interior and found himself enthralled by this lost piece of history. He went from room to room taking photographs and that was when he discovered a hatch in one of the bedrooms. He gathered up his courage, cracked that hatch open, and descended into pure darkness. Much to his surprise, Jim was inside a fully equipped subterranean level, like something out of a video game. The dungeon, or the bunker if you would prefer, was clearly designed for a family to live inside of for months. It was just as big below the house as it was above with at least eight rooms inside the nuclear bomb shelter. The shelter was installed much later by one of the more recent residents, and considering they had had enough money to purchase a mansion and build an underground bunker beneath it, they probably didn't mind leaving it behind when they moved to a new place. It's good news for everyone in the area, since now they know, if it ever becomes necessary, they will have a free fallout shelter within running distance of their homes. It's shout out time! Big thank you to Michael Harkin and Think Different Zero One for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. Pet Cemetery. Urban explorer Daniel Sims came across an old, damaged, and seriously derelict mansion hidden away in a small English village. It was a pretty straightforward abandoned property, covered in graffiti, filled with bottles and cans from partying teenagers, and evidence of a fire inside the house. But what made it unique and even creepier than normal is that Daniel came across a mysterious pet cemetery. He originally found the house while looking at online maps. It was tucked away in such a random corner of the village that it would have been impossible to find by just wandering around. But what Daniel hadn't expected was that the house was actually an old and abandoned assisted living home. There were metal bars on the second floor windows to stop people from jumping out or possibly escaping. The walls were painted a disturbing shade of yellow, and as far as Daniel could tell, the place had only been abandoned for about a decade. The creepiest part was when he discovered the remains of a graveyard in the back of the house. He thought he was standing on the bones of people who had been buried by the staff at the home. It was only when he scrutinized the names on the tombstones that he realized they were animals. He doesn't know why, but the abandoned mansion had its very own graveyard of dead pets. The Shopping Complex On Queen Street at Campbelltown, a popular shopping area in the Australian city of Sydney, there is an abandoned mall. It's a shopping center that's been left for dead, unused for over a decade, and is currently in a serious state of disrepair. The shopping complex was once called Brands on Sale, but now it's more of a hub for curious urban explorers. After 10 years of being raided by party-going teenagers and visited by urban explorers and YouTubers, it just gets more and more destroyed. The escalators have been ripped apart. There are holes in the walls where people have thrown things through them, shattered glass all over the place, and no security to keep anyone out. The shopping complex is four stories of nothing but garbage. The structural integrity of the building seems totally fine, which makes it even stranger that nobody has turned the property into something productive. 
The center originally cost $65 million to open in December 2009, only to go out of business about a year later. Abandoned Disney In 2020, during the Great Panini, a man broke into an abandoned Disney World attraction and then posted videos of his highly illegal exploration on YouTube. His name is Richard McGuire, 42 years old at the time. Richard traveled from Mobile, Alabama to the Orlando theme park and found his way to Discovery Island. Discovery Island was once a very popular attraction for the public. Covering about 11 acres, it was home to all kinds of exotic animals and looked like a real tropical paradise. However, the island was plagued by scandals. There were rumors there was brain-eating bacteria in the water. In 1989, workers came under fire for abusing some birds, and people just slowly stopped going. In 1999, the island was closed. Disney hasn't done anything with it and never released an official statement, but it's most likely it was just replaced by the much larger and more popular Animal Kingdom. Now it's sitting abandoned in a lake, overgrown and covered in rusty metal cages. Urban explorers like Richard have reported seeing alligators prowling around and lights turning on and off even though nobody is there. Richard thought it would be fun to take a camping trip here, but it didn't turn out to be much fun after all. He was caught breaking and entering on surveillance footage, and the police swarmed the island as if they were trying to catch El Chapo. Richard was arrested on April 30, 2020. Authorities had to take a boat to go get him and take him to the main part of the park, then hauled him away to prison. He was quickly released on bail, and although he was looking at 12 months in jail, he just ended up paying a $100 fine and charges were dropped. Others have managed to get away with camping here and have posted it on YouTube, even though Disney has a clear ban on the area for people's safety. Finding a Mummy A Spanish urban explorer crept into an abandoned building in the city of Alicante and came across the last thing he had expected to find. It was about 10.30 p.m. He had just arrived inside the abandoned building, and before he could really poke around the place, he found a mummified corpse. This wasn't a fake mummy, but a very real, preserved human body. The explorer was so startled that he immediately called the Spanish National Police. When they got there, he showed them the exact location of the body. By the corpse was a backpack which held the man's ID. He was identified as Julian Ortega, 56 years old when he disappeared in July 2019. That was three years before the explorer found him in May 2022. Clearly, this building hadn't attracted any other explorers. For three years, Julian's body had slowly decayed in that empty place, with nobody ever finding it. As of right now, we don't know if he was murdered, if he had been an urban explorer himself, who maybe suffered a heart attack, or what. It's all still under police investigation, and we don't have any answers. Abandoned Hospital In 1997, the East Fortune Hospital closed its doors and never opened them again. This very old and now condemned psychiatric hospital can be found near the Scottish city of Edinburgh. And even though the entrance to the abandoned building is boarded up and entry is completely forbidden, that hasn't stopped urban explorers from poking around. Just recently, footage showed up online of an urban explorer known only as Tina taking a gander inside. She documented her trip through the haunting ruins of what had once been a treatment center for those suffering from tuberculosis. The building has been around for 100 years. The last quarter of its life may have been spent empty, but the first 75 years were filled with pain and misery. It was originally used to treat tuberculosis, only to change in the 1950s and become a psychiatric hospital. It went from the deceased and the dead to those suffering from horrible mental afflictions. What's really interesting is that a lot of the original equipment and furnishings are still in there. Old musical instruments, wrecked hospital equipment, chairs, tables, and asbestos everywhere. And although nothing happened to our urban explorer as she documented the hospital's most recent state of disrepair, it's essentially waiting to collapse. The Forgotten Farm A man named Kyle, a 25-year-old who sees himself as an urban explorer, has been busy ever since the pandemic. According to Kyle, he's explored over 400 abandoned properties since he picked up the hobby in 2020. One of his more recent expeditions took him to a small farmhouse in Little Hereford, England. Amazingly, Kyle only heard about the abandoned farmhouse because he saw it on a random Facebook page talking about abandoned places. In April 2022, he made the journey there and broke into the house. 
What he discovered was a building in a slow state of decay, but surprisingly still filled with the former owner's possessions. Inside the building, Kyle came across an old sewing machine, candlesticks on the fireplace, sheet music still waiting to be played on the piano, and haunting pictures of the old residents. At first, he couldn't tell exactly how old the farm was. It seemed to be from a bygone age, and yet when he came into the kitchen, he found a calendar on the wall from 1998. Judging by the furniture in the place, it was probably lived in by the same family since the 1960s. Then, in January 1998, they just vanished. They didn't pack up, but definitely left. We don't know if they got spooked by something in the house, if they had fallen on hard times, or if they all perished in some freak accident. Sunken Ghost City In Mexico in 2020, the Vicente Guerrero Dam reached its lowest level in 12 years. It was at only 48% capacity, its lowest since 2008 when Mexico was afflicted by some serious drought. And while drought is never good for anybody, there was one good thing that came out of the low water level. It revealed the creepy abandoned village of Old Padilla. The dam is a massive reservoir, the sixth largest in Mexico. The dam is mostly used to contain floods and began its life in September 1971. But in order to get the dam up and running, Old Padilla or Villa del Padilla had to be flooded, and so the village was emptied and the people were forced out. This was pretty tragic for the townspeople considering just how long Old Padilla had been in that same spot. The very first foundations were laid in 1749, and in 1824, Emperor Agustin de Iturbide was shot there. It became the first capital of the state of Tamaulipas in July 1825, and then in 1970, the place was evacuated. With the dam so low on water, everyone could see the ruins of this lost city. Although there really isn't much left to look at. There are some old stone steps, the remains of what was once a beautiful park where people walked and children played, and the crumbling ruins of homes whose residents, after multiple generations, were forced to find somewhere else to live. Thanks for watching! Which of these abandoned sites would you be brave enough to explore, or have you already? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe and come back soon! Bye!